I don't even know if I need this microphone. I think small mics pick up my voice. I know that pretty well. Anyway. <laughs> the, uh, the PowerPoint, really, I put together uh, just to show the labors I had to go through to complete this project, which I'm not quite sure I would have done this most recent book, The Nixon Defense, had I known what I was getting into. What happened is my editor came to me uh, well before the approaching 40th anniversary of the Watergate break-in, which was on June 17th of 2012, uh, and said, are there any questions you have at this late date about Watergate? And I said, sure, there are a couple of them. I said, you know, but really there's one overriding question that I've really never been able to figure out as close as I was to it all. How could anybody as savvy as Richard Nixon get himself into the mess he got into? How could he let his presidency literally just disintegrate on a, on a bungled burglary? And I said, as, as close as I was to the story, so much happened behind the scenes when I wasn't there that I really would love to get the answer to that question. I, and I figure the tapes probably answer most of that, those questions. Uh, and I think probably enough of the tapes have been transcribed that I can find the answer with maybe a few more transcriptions. So that's where the project started in 2009, uh, after my last book. And I began researching and looking at the tapes, and first of all discovered nobody in all these years has ever cataloged them all. Uh, I found, I found there were about 400 tapes in varying degrees that someone had tried to transcribe, not full transcripts. The, there were 80 transcripts I found from the Watergate Special Prosecution Office effort, uh, 12 of which were really good because they were used in the trial of Haldeman, Ehrlichman, Mitchell, et al., and they'd obviously gone through them very closely to figure out you know, who was saying what and when. The rest of the 80 uh, Watergate Special Prosecution Force tapes uh, really were terrible. They were, uh, they were pretty good for getting what someone said, but not having the right person say it. <coughs> so I asked one of the prosecutors uh, who I, uh, I knew pretty well, I said, who did these? And they said, these were done by FBI secretaries. So I realized those would have to all be redone. Uh, then I looked at Stanley Cutler's uh, transcripts. Stanley did a book, in fact, Stanley, uh, professor from Wisconsin who forced Nixon to release the tapes long before he really wanted to release them. Uh, and he got in the archives right after he got a court order and did a slew of tapes, all what they call the abuse of process tapes, as quickly as the archives could process them. Uh, and what, when I say the, the archives processed them, what they've done over these four decades, in fact, I dedicate my book to the uh, men and women at the National Archives who spent four decades processing these tapes because this, is, this was a monumental assignment and you have to have worked with these tapes as much as I have to appreciate how how hard this work was that they did. So I figured I, I actually named them all as well as in the acknowledgments because I think they really deserve a lot of credit. Because what they had to do is go through and take out any personal information uh, and then take out any national security information. And then uh, at that time they were doing them with all analog tapes. That was no small assignment. And to do it, what they did is they prepared what they call a subject log. And that subject log would have the name of the person speaking and then the, not a transcript, but the gist that they could pick up of what was being said. For example, it might be uh, Henry Kissinger and it might be uh, Paris Peace Talks and it might have Ambassador Bunker, Saigon or something, you know, little clips like that that would give you the gist of the conversation. So when I started the project, I went through all the subject logs of all the tapes uh, and was able, Watergate became uh, very quickly a subject <coughs> and who was who and what they were the gist of what they were talking about and I, I, come, I came up with a thousand conversations uh, and so I realized very quickly that there were probably 600 conversations that nobody outside the archives in preparing the subject logs had ever listened to 
So I asked Stanley Cutler, I said, how did you select the 400 conversations on Watergate you selected? He said, I, he said, I thought they looked like they'd be good conversations. Uh, not a really strict uh, historical criteria, uh, which Stanley admitted. He said, I just was looking what looked interesting based on the subject logs. Uh, where there was no continuity and you might not get the conversation before or after so you couldn't always put it in context. So to make a long story short, I'm a year into the project and I say to myself, I, the only way I'm going to answer this question of how Nixon got in this mess, because I started at sort of the end, in his last defense, when he claims and puts out, first of all, a, a statement and then he puts out a written document later that he knew nothing about Watergate until I had told him on March 21st of 1973. You'll recall the break-in occurs on, on June 17th of 1972 during the campaign and it's March of 73, or four, uh, yes, March of 73 when he puts out sort of his final defense and that's the basis he'll fight to, to keep his office on. Uh, and I was working back from that to figure out how he came to that statement and I kept having to go back early and earlier so to make that story very short I realized I had to go back to the first tape he recorded from the time he got uh, knowledge of the Watergate break-in and get them all so they're in essence all but about 12 conversations that were well done uh, I had a basically a thousand conversations I had to transcribe and I'm a year into the project. I told my editor, I said, God, this is just an awful mess. Uh, I will never, I don't know how I will complete it. I certainly can't complete it by uh, 2012. I'm going to hire some grad students uh, and see if they can, how quickly they can do this and, and get a feel for it, if, if that we can even pursue this project. Uh, well, I got, I got lucky. I got one woman, uh, the first one I hired was a working on her master's at that time in archival science. She was a former legal secretary. Uh, she was terrific. She would end up transcribing 500 conversations. Uh, I have a clip in my uh, PowerPoint where uh, Charity explains how she did this. Uh, what I did as I, w I was over at Microsoft today and because I used a lot of their equipment I thought I ought to explain how I they had been very helpful in one regard uh, that in the, I found a digitizer for the cassettes they gave me these little 90 minute cassettes uh, analog cassettes and they said these are where the conversations are uh, they may or may not be broken up, but you know this is this is it. And I mean stacks of these things, which I have a picture of. Uh, and I, I said this is a problem too because the analog is re digital had come in, but uh, nobody had digitized them yet. I did some research and found in the United Kingdom a, a a company that makes a digitizer for cassettes to convert cassettes to digital. Uh, form. Uh, the problem was that uh, the computer specifications uh, to, to do this uh, were way beyond anything I could find around and it would only work on the old Windows XP software. So to make a long story short, I called the people in England and talked to them. I said, what would happen if I got, a, got some XP Windows software and put it on a MacBook in virtual operation. A MacBook can operate as a Windows machine because it far exceeded the specifications they needed. And they said, we don't know. Why don't you try it? So I did. Uh, and it worked, uh, much to their delight because they were procrastinating. They said, we don't have a big market to, to digitize old analog conversations. So I did and it, it, as I say that I worked and uh, I would just, it t would take me five minutes to digitize a 90 minute conversation. Uh, the archives just drooled when they saw my machine because uh, I was so far ahead of them in digitizing this. And once I got them in digital form they were actually a little easier to transcribe. The, this is a very primitive system. 
Uh, I do have a, some wonderful graphics of where Nixon put them in the Oval Office and his other offices. Uh, basically in the desk. Uh, his desk, for example, had belonged to Woodrow Wilson. And to put these little small microphones in uh, the desk, they simply drilled holes in Woodrow Wilson's desk uh, in four places. Uh, there were one on the side, two in the front, uh, one on the other side, and then one down by his drawer uh, at the bottom. And the problem with that microphone, uh, which is known as M1, if you see the, uh, uh, the chart, is he would sit back in his chair with his feet up on his desk and always be talking through his legs and his pants uh, to that microphone, making it particularly difficult to hear him. Uh, he'd slide his, with his chair back. I tended to sit right over a microphone almost every time I was in the office, uh, thankfully, actually. Uh, Haldeman is, is very good, and Kissinger is very good, and Ehrlichman is very good. The EOB office is, is pretty good. Uh, his executive office building office, where they tape a lot of their conversations, is terrible. Nobody sat around the desk where they drilled the holes and put the microphones. Uh, he had a chair and an ottoman beside his desk, uh, where he sat, and people sat way back from that, that location, and some of the most important conversations happened there. So what we found the remedy for that, first of all, trying multiple software and tweaking it uh, uh, to try to, it distorts the voices terribly, but you can actually pick up words. And the secret, anybody who's ever done transcription is doing it over and over and over. Sometimes, you know, it's interesting, different machines I could hear it on uh, better than other machines. And the repetition, though, is the key. In fact, uh, reading my, I, I explained some of this in the preface of the book, and I had a call uh, just before I came up here from George Lardner, who was the Washington Post reporter that for years went out to the archives uh, when they released new tapes and had to listen to them. And George said, John, I just finished your preface and said you brought back memories of that over and over and over listening and that you actually can pick it up. He said, he asked me, he said, did it ever happen to you where some days you couldn't hear it and the next day you walked in and you could hear it? I said, absolutely, George. He said, it's a weird experience where you, you, you sometimes just your own mood makes it different. And I'm very good at recognizing the voices. And I found I heard things that other transcribers didn't, like Stanley Cutler's uh, court reporters he brought in could not hear. A wonderful example is Mark Felt, who was Deep Throat. Cutler has a transcript. Uh, as a result of my going over to the criminal division, to the, uh, uh, at the Department of Justice, and Henry Peterson, uh, the head of the criminal division, telling me in October, of 1972, uh, right at the height of the cover-up, he said, John, he said, Mark Felt, who's the number two man at the FBI, is leaking like a sieve. I said, Henry, how do you know that? He said, well, he said, the general counsel for the news organization to whom he's leaking came in today, is very worried that they could be involved in obstruction of justice or they're getting secret information out of the grand jury and is, he's in here to protect his clients. He, he asked for confidentiality. I'm not going to tell you his name, uh, but uh, he, Henry said, I'm not surprised. He said, I, I've known Mark Felt since we both were in the FBI together. In fact, he's known because of his premature white hair and his propensity to talk to the media as the white rat. <laughs> which I hadn't known until that time. Anyway, he said, uh, I, I haven't told the Attorney General, uh, Dick Kleindies, I haven't told the Acting Director of the FBI, uh, uh, Pat Gray, because I'm worried what they might do with it, but I think you should know at the White House. Anyway, I take that information back to Bob Haldeman, who in turn takes it into the President. Uh, when Cutler transcribes that conversation, at one point in the conversation, he hears Nixon responding to what he'd do. He says, in essence, uh, Bob, you know what I would do with Felt? And then Cutler's got an expletive uh, that Nixon just like dropped off and said something really nasty, which wouldn't be unusual for Nixon. But I heard something very different. And everybody now who listens to that tape hears what I heard. He, what, what he says is, you know what I would do with Felt, Bob? Ambassadorship. 
he would appoint him an ambassador to get him out of there and not cause any problem. This is exactly what he'll do with the head of the CIA, Dick Helms, uh, several months later. Uh, that didn't happen uh, because as, as it would happen when he appoints Pat Gray to run the FBI, he tells him about this problem we've learned about. And Gray doesn't believe him, uh, much to his uh, later problem, because Felt will turn on Gray, draw him into a criminal action, and claim that he authorized an, un, uh, an unauthorized uh, break-in into the Weatherman's headquarters, which he had, Gray wasn't even around, didn't even know about it. But Felt reached out and pulled him in with a couple other people in the FBI, and Gray was, until he got a really good criminal lawyer, about to go down the tubes on, on Mark Felt's uh, word that he got gotten approval from Pat Gray. Uh, at that time, Gray began to believe that, yes, this man might have been a leaker or worse. So anyway, I heard different things on these tapes than other people did. And often I would take a passage that would last, it could be just a five-minute passage, but I realized this is really important stuff. So I would spend hours, sometimes eight hours, on, on five minutes worth of conversation. Uh, the long and short of all this is every page of the new book has something, virtually every page, I didn't know before I did this drill. Uh, I would take, I don't do, I didn't do a book of transcripts. I did, I pulled narrative and dialogue out of the transcripts. Uh, I had done that in another book called The Rehnquist Choice. Uh, it was a book that w was well received by historians. As it happened, uh, most readers never even were ever aware of the book. The book was shipped uh, 10 days, what they call a laydown, uh, where it couldn't be sold, uh, 10 days before 9-11. And if you didn't have Osama in a title after 9-11, after your book just disappeared. I don't know about this bookstore, but I, uh, every bookstore I visited in that period, uh, it was not, not a good time to be in the book business uh, or an author. Uh, but anyway, the, I, I, over the years, historians have discovered that book and say, what a wonderful way to handle the tapes. Transcripts are pretty tough reading, uh, whereas to take the story out of them uh, is exactly the way to do it. And that's what I did in the new book. And I told my editor, I said, I'm not sure which was more difficult, transcribing them or turning around and then digesting them down to narrative and dialogue. Because in Watergate, Nixon gets very repetitive. He is literally obsessive compulsive. Anyway, what, this crowd, how many of you here watched Watergate and the hearings? Well, we know the age of this crowd. <laughs> uh, how many saw the Colbert show? Oh, a couple did. I had fun on that, as you can tell. <laughs> uh, different audience. I was glad to see it, it, it got, because uh, young people have actually uh, found this book, which is very encouraging. It's, it's been on, uh, nothing stayed on the bestseller list long, but this has been on. It went on for three, stayed on for three weeks anyway, so that's uh, better than not making the bestseller list. Anyway, the uh, the basic question I set out to answer, I there is no question relating to Watergate today that I don't have an answer to now. There is no mystery left. There is nothing that uh, the tapes don't finally answer, uh, and that's all in that book. Unfortunately, I couldn't do it. In, in a book that is uh, uh, just a few hundred pages. Uh, it, it is a big book. And the most difficult bar, part of the book is this obsessive compulsive nature that Nixon has. I warn readers in the preface, but there's only one way to understand how he handles Watergate. And that is not well. He gets, he gets into these conversations where he will repeat them, not only with different people, the same person, five minutes later, comes back in the office, he'll have the same conversation again. So what I answered the question in my mind, and I think any reader who, I, I, I keep the commentary out of it. For example, I, I play a, a, a transcript uh, that's kind of fun uh, and interesting, not too, it's pretty serious to call it fun, but it, it, it is, it, it actually draws a lot of laughter to hear Nixon uh, in one of these things I sort of discovered along the way, which was, I can't really believe I'm hearing this. Uh, it's a conversation where Nixon is selling an ambassadorship 
to raise money for the Watergate defendants, uh, something I had, had no idea he had done. Uh, on March 2nd, uh, Haldeman tells him that I'm reported to him that uh, John Mitchell, the former Attorney General campaign manager, is, who is in charge of raising the money at this point to pay these guys to remain silent, is having difficulty. But he's found an answer with a fellow by the name of, uh, of Thomas Pappas, who had been Eisenhower's ambassador to Greece. He was also a member of the Finance Committee to reelect the President, one of the fundraisers. And, and Holman explains that Pappas has sold, he's a very successful American businessman who's been operating in Greece. He has sold one of his major companies, as uh, Holman describes him, as one of the J. Paul Gettys of the world now that nobody seems to know. And he says, best of all, it's all cash, and he can deal in cash. And he's helping Mitchell out. Four nights later, Nixon holds a dinner for his heavy hitters, the, those who were the six-figure and up, uh, the 100,000 and up contributors. Now, today, th that doesn't sound like a lot of money. It's, it is a lot of money, but it's, you know, just multiply that by, what, roughly 5.5, and you get sort of the, the bottom dollar uh, as to the, in today's value. So these were, these were serious contributors, and, and Pappas is at that dinner at the White House, and gets a hold of Nixon and says, I really need to talk to you, because uh, he wants to talk about what he's doing with Mitchell over at the reelection committee. And they have a conversation, and so Haldeman is in the office the next morning and sees Pappas is on the schedule for March 6th, or excuse me, March 7th. Uh, and uh, Nixon explains that he had run into him the night before and he'd wanted this meeting and he said, didn't you tell me the other day that Pappas is raising money? And, and Haldeman said, yes, I did. Uh, he, said that, he said he just wanted to understand it a little bit better. And so Pappas comes into the meeting after some small talk, they get right down to it. And the conversation kind of sticks out to me because when I wrote the book, I tried to not characterize meetings uh, or give a lot of commentary, just let the facts speak for themselves as I digested these conversations. And in this particular one, I described it as it, it reminding me of something from The Godfather, the movie, because uh, Pappas has this kind of uh, uh, deep, uh, raspy voice, and Nixon and he are clearly kind of huddling and talking about this rather sensitive matter, uh, and it just struck me, and, and, and so we used uh, uh, the editing system is the internal Windows editing system where the editor can leave a little balloon out on the side on the margin with a question, and he said, do you really want to use that phrase, which is unlike anything else you've done, uh, where you call it as being something from The Godfather? And I, he was right, I didn't, so I, I took it out, but the conversation really speaks for itself, and you, you hear Nixon and Pappas discussing this, and it's really an extraordinary conversation where uh, Nixon says he thanks him for doing something, he said, you've gone beyond friendship, and he, he claims that all these people are guilty, and he knows it, and it's, it's really uh, uh, a clear quid pro quo, because uh, Pappas wants a fellow by the name of Taskus, who is the current ambassador and a friend of his, uh, to remain in Greece for business reasons. And Nixon says, fine, you got it. Uh, so, and Holloman has just told him before the meeting to make sure he knows that this is a quid pro quo arrangement. Uh, it's a clear criminal violation uh, that uh, they undertake. Anyway, that, that, is, that is, is, is typical. There were lots of revelations along the way. There's probably not a page of the book where I didn't learn something, even my own conversations, because when I wrote the, the one book before on this subject, Blind Ambition, I had some, I had a lot of the transcripts of my own meetings, but I didn't have the audio. And you hear something very different when you hear the audio. You can really sense the emotions of the conversation, you can sense the reactions, the pauses. Uh, for example, my March 21st conversation, uh, I didn't hear the audio to it, and, but there are occasionally long pauses. And Nixon, I found his diary note that night after that conversation, he clearly recognizes I've warning him about the problems, but he says he thinks I'm being too emotional. 
what he doesn't realize, it's not emotion. I'm just unbelievably frustrated. I can't convince this man that what we're doing is just a disaster and criminal. Uh, I take him through one point after another trying to persuade him. Uh, I'm hoping to see his fist hit the desk where he says, this has got to stop. Uh, and every point I raise, he has an answer. I tell him at one point, you know, one of, the, one of his aides, Bud Krogh, has committed perjury. Uh, well, he says, well, John, perjury is a tough rap to prove. Uh, another, <laughs> a, 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 another point I tell him, you know, I don't know how much these people are going to demand in money, but, it, you know, it's just who knows and how long it'll go. He says, well, John, how much could it cost? And I pulled out of thin air what I thought at the time was a pretty hefty number. I hadn't really thought about this, but just to try to shock him, I said, well, it could, over the next two years, it could cost a, thousand, a million dollars. And he says, he says, well, that's no problem. I know where we can get a million dollars. What I don't know is earlier he's talked to Pappas about raising money. As soon as I leave, he calls Rose Woods in, his secretary, and they have, and she controls a slush fund that nobody had ever known about until I found this conversation. And she says, I've got $400,000 in my little slush fund. He says, well, don't tell anybody. I may need it. Uh, so, you know, he's, he's deeply involved in this. Uh, there are some surprises, too. He, early on, uh, he's not being told by Haldeman. He, I, I don't meet with him for eight months. The, his initial information comes from three sources, from Haldeman, initially, it from then Ehrlichman subsequently, and the Washington Post. These are the only places he's learning anything about Watergate. Uh, when he talks to Mitchell, uh, it's very guarded and he's too embarrassed, as he later explains to Haldeman, he said, I was afraid to ask Mitchell if he was responsible for this. Uh, and, and, and Haldeman said, why? And he says, well, what if he said, yes, I am. What do I say next? So he never asked Mitchell uh, if he has approved this. These sort of little facts fill in the details none of us have ever known about this story. As I say today, I've got no questions at all. When Bob Woodward, who uh, told me I didn't realize he'd been covering the story for 42 years, he reviews it for the Washington Post, um, his most interesting comment was to compare it. He said, John, he said, and he writes this, but he also told me privately, he said, he said, you make in this book House of Cards. How many here have seen House of Cards? He said, you make House of Cards unsophisticated. <laughs> <laughs> I had not watched House of Cards. My wife, uh, Mo, who is still my wife, uh, we, we binged watch it over a couple weekends. Uh, and it's pretty good, <laughs> very good. And uh, Bob might be right. <laughs> So anyway, uh, it, it's been a great drill. It, it, it's, uh, the reviews have been wonderful. I didn't understand the review from the guy in the, in the New York Times, uh, but he does have something that was, in, in a sense, right. Uh, first, uh, Bob Dalek, who's a presidential scholar, did it for the Daily Times and calls it a definitive work, which I think, which is nice. That, that, that I'm, I'm, he would appreciate that because he did a book called Kissinger, Nixon and Kissinger, and had done some of the tapes, and he was also aware of this uh, obsessive compulsive uh, operation or, or nature of Nixon uh, in other areas. Um, the, uh, the other reviewer, a fellow from Stanford, uh, says, well, you know, maybe this, he doesn't really get the book, uh, but he says, you know, maybe it should be called the Dean Defense. This is what I didn't know, that how well I would come out in these tapes. Uh, I knew what I had done. I knew it had never been fully explained. I didn't do the book for that purpose, or I would have named it the Dean Defense if I had. Uh, but th this comes to me late. Uh, the book, um, uh, I'm enjoying the fact that uh, people are finding it, even as heavy a reading as it is, a good read, which is always what an author likes to hear. Uh, so that we close on that note. I, I, one other thing I want to say about the book. Can I have a copy of the book? Don't I don't. <laughs> I don't. First of all, it feels good. <laughs> it's got a very interesting cover, but I, what, I was imp what I was also impressed with is they took, when I got the bound galleys, I was frightened. The book was like this thick. They'd done it on a kind of a thick paper. And I said, my God, nobody's going to read this. In fact, I told Mo, I said, 
look at this. Would you ever read a book like this? She said, well, as a matter of fact, I would. I get it as an e-book. <laughs> she says, I like big books. Uh, but anyway, they, so they reduced it. But what I like is it's the nicest produced book I've ever had because the binding is just, I've never had a binding like this that just opens perfectly everywhere, uh, <laughs> which is very cool. Anyway, go test a copy, but meanwhile, <laughs> meanwhile, let me try to answer any of your questions. I, I, I might, while well, we spend a little bit more time here this evening. Yes, question over here. A couple of questions about Mark Felt. Uh, if you knew that early, and the Justice Department knew, and other people at the White House knew, why did it take until Mark Felt was on his deathbed before he talked about it? Good, good reason. Let me answer that. Let me answer that one first. Let me do that one first. Let me answer. You talked about Woodward about. <laughs> yes, I have. But let me first answer why it took so long to figure out who Mark Felt was. I obviously knew this information, but Mark F Bob Woodward told me very early that John, when you see all the clues that are dropped in all the president's men, they'll all fit. They don't all fit. They don't all fit. The one that throws it off is the last big clue. It, it felt is a source, Mark, Deep Throat is a source from June 19th, two days after the rest, to the first week of November of 1973, when he purportedly tells Woodward that one or more of the tapes has been erased or tampered with somehow. The problem with that last clue is, Felt is out of the FBI in May of 73. There's, he's not in the loop anymore. I can't figure any way that Felt would have had that information from any reliable source at that time. I know all the people who had that information. Bob, when I raised that with him, because yes, I have talked to him about it, uh, he said, I'm not going to talk to you about that. Uh, now he could theoretically say, listen, I'm just spreading some breadcrumbs around to, to keep people off the track. Uh, he doesn't want to talk about it. In fact. If you, any of you saw the interview we did on C-SPAN, uh, anybody see that? Nobody saw it. We, they've been playing a lot, which surprised me. Anyway, he, he uh, interviewed me for about a 45-minute conversation. Before we started, I said to him, Bob, and I, actually I alluded to this at the table, I said, the two of us probably know more about this subject than any two people in the world. Uh, which I think is true. Uh, and I said, we have to be very careful we don't get so far inside baseball that nobody knows what we're talking about, uh, which we did. We stayed out of the kind of really sort of nuanced things that might interest he and I, and he and I have talked about on, on some occasions. But anyway, on Mark Felt, there's one paragraph in the book. He said, the only thing I have, a, the only paragraph in this whole book I don't, I'm just not fascinated by it, because he said, John, he said, I didn't know all this stuff. He said, we did the final days, we did, you know, we, you know, I've been on this story for 42 years, you showed, you told me a whole new story, uh, and filled in everything I didn't know. Uh, so it was new to him, uh, which was encouraging. He actually called me to tell me he was reviewing it, because I didn't know he was, uh, and he wouldn't have taken it on if he hadn't opened it and found it uh, getting his attention. So. Uh, the, one of the things that uh, uh, we, the one paragraph that he has trouble with that I wrote, I said, in the, somewhere in the narrative, there's a, a reference to the fact that I can never, have never found what Mark Felt was referring to when he talks about this large espionage conspiracy operation that's being run out of the White House or by Nixon somehow. And to this day, I don't know what the hell he's talking about. I don't think it exists. And Bob says, well, there's Segretti doing this in 22 states. I said, Bob, Segretti wasn't reporting to the White House. We had no idea what he was doing. Uh, we talked it, we, we debated it way inside baseball for a while. And he said, well, John, let's just leave it at this. We'll agree to disagree on this point. Uh, I think I could win this argument. And I told him, I said, you give me a jury with my argument and you take your argument and we'll let the jury decide who's got this right. Uh, because there are lots of problems. Felt has got lots of things wrong to be the number two man, in essence, number the number one man in the FBI 
uh, who has access to all this information. There's remarkably misinformation. Bob will confess to a little of it, but not all of it. Uh, and the, the sad thing is some of it has become part of the lore uh, as actually being part of Watergate when it's just purely Mark Feld. Uh, there's a very interesting book uh, done by a guy I worked with uh, on, on Feld called Leak by Max Holland. Uh, been, uh, Max did a good job, talked to a lot of Felt's former colleagues. Uh, Felt was not held in the highest esteem by all of his colleagues. Uh, I guess they were the ones who called him the white rat. Uh, but uh, he, uh, he's a very, very interesting Machiavellian fellow whose story never was really told. The book he would write, uh, in fact, I ran into his lawyer who rewrote his book after he was involved in his disclosure. Uh, when I was do, doing a, uh, a presentation a couple weeks ago in uh, San Francisco, he, he, able guy, and, 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 uh, but a, a lot of it, you know, Feltz just got a lot wrong and never told his full story. He wants to be director. He's trying to ease Pat Gray, the acting director, out. Uh, he doesn't want George McGovern elected because George McGovern would have cleaned the FBI out, uh, but he, he wants to embarrass uh, gray so badly and does uh, and, and, and it par partially succeeds because gray will withdraw uh, but the White House had been tipped by <laughs> Peterson uh, so he's never even considered a question right here how do you think that the, the paranoid aspects of Nixon's personality contributed to his failure? How do I think the paranoid aspect of Nixon's uh, personality contributed to Watergate? He, he's, a, he's a great character. He, he's, he's fascinating. He's very complex. He is a different person with different people. Uh, he, uh, he's, he, he's on a very high plane with me, uh, with some of the speechwriters. Uh, uh, people like Chuck Colson and, and Bob Holloman bring the worst out of him and the real dark side. Uh, but he, with, he's a shy person, he's not good with people. For somebody who's a politician and uh, that's his true forte, it, it's unbelievable how difficult a time he has with strangers. Uh, we had to prepare uh, talking papers for one sheet talking papers when you brought somebody in the office because uh, he wanted to know why they were in there and you know what was the purpose and what how long was the meeting supposed to last and what have you but always the bottom line that he could look at quickly if he didn't look at the rest is what should he say to start a conversation you know like oh i understand you just won the allentown bowling contest or something <laughs> like that you know so cuz he just wasn't good at that sort of thing uh, I don't know how paranoid Nixon was. I do know that after doing the book, I decided, I went into the book trying to figure out how somebody so savvy could make the mistakes he made. The problem is he's not so savvy. Uh, that's what really comes out of the book. Uh, readers are telling me that now that they have, have seen the mistakes. It's not always sort of a pure criminality. Uh, a lot of it is just stupidity, believe it or not. Uh, he, the way he makes decisions in Watergate, uh, I think scholars are going to have to look at this presidency again uh, and really raise questions if Nixon is uh, sort of the master executive that he portrayed himself as, because he sure wasn't with Watergate, uh, and that's what gets him in the trouble he gets into. Uh, he'll lie and, and dissemble and then try to make that the fact, uh, and it's not always out of paranoia. Uh, there is an element uh, of that, but it's not terribly serious. What I think you're referring to are things like his enemies list, where uh, the, the more he succeeds, the more vengeful he becomes. It's fascinating to see, as he knows he's going to win re-election, he's doing more and more planning about how he's going to get after his perceived enemies. Uh, he is going to level, he's going to spend his entire <laughs> second term uh, uh, taking care of him. Uh, it, it, I, God forbid, you know, that happened. He really is crippled as he goes into the second term because of Watergate and never gets that opportunity. But there was going to be nothing left unturned uh, as far as his ability to use the system to try to hurt the people. And he has a long memory as to who has offended him 
and who he wants to get after, which is a very uh, odd trait for somebody. He's not a gracious winner. Uh, he's a very bitter winner. That he's won, they've lost, and they're going to pay for it. Question. Yes, sir. This is really very personal, and I'm, I'm sure it's a strange question given that we get a lot of questions, but um, in your personal relationship with him, as well as your professional relationship with him, I, I know a lot of the problems of his personality. Were there any redeeming qualities? Was he a friend? Did you consider him a friend, or was he just... He's... Uh, did, did you all hear that? Everybody hear that? Yeah. Good. Um, he... There's an interesting conversation in the book where he talks about how, as president, he can't be buddy-buddy with anybody. Uh, that he can't go, in fact, this is one time when he asked Holloman if I'm in my office, and Holloman says yes, he said, he's in essence saying, I can't go over to Dean's office and say hello or uh, what have you. Uh, I need him to come here and it has to be all that formality. So there, there, he, is, he is not really pals with anybody. Uh, his closest friend appears to be B.B. Rebozo. Uh, and I learned a little bit about that as uh, after Alex Butterfield left the White House, I took over Alex's job of liaison with the Secret Service, uh, which meant that when the Secret Service had a, pro you know, the presidential protection detail had a problem, uh, they don't go to the president, they would come to me, as they had Alex earlier. And one day they came in and said, uh, B.B. is driving the president again out at San Clemente uh, and the president's saying to the Secret Service, I don't want you in the car uh, and, and B.B.'s taking me to the restaurant. And, and the service is going, they're having conniptions because uh, they need to be in control of all his movements and what have you. Uh, will you take care of that? And I did, but, but I, I, I said, <laughs> we got into a conversation uh, and I said, what, what's going on when they go out on B.B.'s houseboat for hours? And uh, the guy who's the head of the detail told me, he said, well, you know, one time I, was, I used to be stationed up on the roof of the houseboat in a chair, uh, just sort of watching and, and what have you. And one time I was sitting up there and I heard, I heard nothing down in the cabin. And I became concerned, so I took off my shoes and went down the ladder and looked in the window uh, to see what, I wasn't trying to be a peeping Tom, but I just wondered what's going on in there. And he said, I discovered they're just sitting there and not talking to each other. <laughs> and he said, so I asked some of the other agents about, you know, when they take these long walks on the beach. And, and uh, they told me that often they'll walk for miles and the president will say nothing to B.B. Uh, he just likes to have him there. Uh, so I don't know what that reveals about his personality. Uh, and I've li there, there, are, there are not a lot of B.B. phone calls that don't fall in the personal category, but there are enough of them, and I, they're not rel relevant to this book, but I listened to a lot of them, just curious as to know what was going on. Uh, and some of them I don't even understand what they're talking about. Uh, where BB's out tracking down some money man uh, at some point, and and what it means, I didn't try to figure out whether it could just be a contributor, whether it's some personal business they're dealing with, it, but it was enough that it fit in somehow into the tapes that didn't get withdrawn. Uh, although there are some tapes that I listened to that probably should have been withdrawn, but you know they uh, just slipped through the system. Although the archives is very good at this, they, they you know some things. For example, they're not supposed to have the taping machine on when the president goes into his bathroom, uh, and that does happen sometimes. <laughs> but anyway, uh, my relationship with him is, as I say, he's, he's, he's actually, I realize today, he's showing off for me. Uh, he's trying to impress me. Uh, he's trying to tell me in some conversations that what he's doing is no worse than what his predecessors are doing. He'll call me back in the office at one point and wants to read to me from a book called 13, uh, Kennedy's 13 Mistakes to make a point that he had made earlier, that he thinks what he's doing is no worse than what his predecessors have done. Uh, so he, he's, a, uh, he's, he's very awkward in his personal relationships. Um, the other thing on, on the upside, though, 
a, a number of conversations between he and his daughters uh, that somehow because they're talking enough related to government that these tapes have not been uh, pulled and often in queuing up the tapes I would stop and listen just out of curiosity to some of these conversations with Trisha or, or Julie and, and the First Lady and I'm sure they were shocked when they heard this, com you know, a lot of this stuff because he has a wonderful relationship with his daughters. He, it is a very loving, uh, nice relationship. He's very thoughtful of them. He calls them regularly. Uh, they'll come up on his, his uh, daily diary quite frequently. He checks in with them. He's very fatherly uh, when he calls them. Uh, when, for example, he thinks he's got peace in Vietnam, uh, he doesn't call Henry, he calls Pat Nixon, and they have a lovely conversation. So, anyway, a couple more questions, because uh, we started late, I'm going to go a little, I'll go until about 10 or so after, and, okay? I just want to say that this does not apply to us. Oh, okay, I didn't hear it anyway. Okay, good. Yes, ma'am. What do you sad you have all your questions answered? Who erased the 18 and a half minutes? I did a, I did a special appendix just for you on that. <laughs> so who did it and what was on it? I, I tell you the six people who could have done it. Mm -hmm. And the fact, Nixon's on there. And the fact that, that it is not as important as to who as to what. That's much more important because who is not going to make a bit of difference in history? In mind, if he was the one who did it. I think he is a potential, but given the way it happens, uh, it's more important why he would have done it and what he would have done. And I answer that to, to get right down to the bottom line. It blows away his defense that he knew nothing before March 21st is the reason it was erased. When you look at the time sequence, uh, the interesting thing I also found along the way is Rosemary Woods could not have done it as she confessed to doing it. It was mechanically impossible. There's a guy in Portland who the FBI found, one of a few who worked on this Your 500 or 5000 uh, taping machine. It was an imported machine and not many technicians in the United States even knew about it or how to work on it or anything about it. It was mechanically built. So you could not do what Rose said she did, where she hit the foot pedal and she'd accidentally turn, hit the record button. Won't work. Absolutely will not work. The machine, in every combination you can think of, Rose could have done it. Uh, it is mechanically impossible uh, the way the machine was designed. So I can't give you a, you want to look at that appendix. Uh, but I also, I just, re when I got my ebook, I decided to read that. And I realize I wrote that so it would be much more understandable if you've read uh, all the book in front of it. It makes much more sense. Do you know why he didn't burn them up? I'm sorry? Do you know why he didn't burn the tapes up? Well, he actually tells Haldeman in April to destroy, to destroy the tapes uh, on two occasions. And Haldeman doesn't do it. Uh, Haldeman uh, gets so consumed. First of all, Haldeman convinces him not to do it for the national security matters because he tells him, you know, Henry uh, has got his own recording system and his own records, and you might want to have your records too. Uh, uh, so your history is more accurate than Henry's. Uh, so that's one reason. And he agrees that he's going to protect the national security stuff. But then he tells Haldeman to get rid of everything else. He's actually kind of embarrassed about the fact that he's recording. And, and then it's just amazing. He just keeps the machine going. Al Haig, after uh, Haldeman and and Ehrlichman and, and I and, and Kleinies have all been fired, uh, is not even told about the system. He knows there's some recordings with me, but he thinks Nixon has just specially had a way he could record me and nobody else. And, and Haig is dumbfounded when he hears Butterfield testify and can't believe anybody would, would do this to himself, where you're getting everything, you know, every swear word you make and every stupid statement you make in a conversation. Uh, and what have you. Well, that's another interesting thing about Nixon. Uh, he, is at t he is very articulate when he know talks about something he knows something about. Foreign affairs, uh, the budget to my surprise. 
but he is very inarticulate on most everything else, and that makes it very difficult for transcription as well. Uh, and I try to clean that up in, in, in doing the book just to get to the gist of things. There was a question over here, yes. I think you mentioned earlier, and I've, I've heard it before, when they said that Nixon was going to use the CIA to throttle the FBI, right. what does that actually mean? How does that occur in a domestic investigation? How could it be accomplished? Well, what happened, that's the so-called smoking gun when Nixon calls for the, on June 23rd, for the CIA to stop the FBI investigation into Mexico is where it really happens. Uh, and and what, what I found out in doing this book is that I had gone over to Pat Gray's office and Gray had told me about the fact that the FBI had discovered this Mexican money. I come back to the White House at six o'clock or so or later. Haldeman has been all day in a meeting at the uh, Kennedy Center where he's a member of the board. So I call Mitchell and tell him about this. And Mitchell says, I'm very worried the CIA is in this. He's just gone, gone through a debriefing where he's learned what, what all Hitty, Liddy and Hunt have done at the F, well, at the White House where, with the CIA's assistance. They've gotten disguises, they've gotten cameras, they've gotten uh, all kinds of help from them. Uh, they've used them for psychological studies of Dan Ellsberg. And he doesn't know, you know where this is all going. Uh, this is, uh, and truly he's, you know, he just, as former Attorney General said, this is bad, John. What you need to do is call Haldeman in the morning. I go to the staff meetings, but it's not the sort of thing I can raise there. Uh, would you, before I get to the staff meeting, call Haldeman? And I told him he was not in, and tell him to invoke the delimitation agreement. I said, the what? Uh, he, he said, yes. He said, since 1948, uh, when Hoover had broken relationships with the, F with the CIA, they do have an understanding that neither one will investigate each other's activities. And he said, this is a perfect instance. Just pull up, tell them to pull back until we figure out what this is all about. This is the conversation. Then Haldeman writes all this down in his notes and takes them in, and he spins it. He, he pushes it even further than I had told him. I never told him to call Helms. I never told him to talk to anybody other than Walters. I certainly didn't tell him to try to stop the FBI investigation. I told him the only thing that was of concern that Mitchell didn't understand was the Mexican money. They didn't know if it was, you know, where it was from. They didn't know if it was a corporate contribution or a legitimate contribution. As it turns out, it was legitimate. Uh, there was no reason to be really concerned about it. <coughs> so. One of the conclusions I come to, I just really put it in a footnote, I actually have like a 50-page memo I wrote when I got really interested in it, working on the book and I'm waiting for the transcribers to get ahead of me uh, to show that the smoking gun tape was firing blanks. I mean, it really was perfectly legitimate. It's not an obstruction of justice. Uh, it is not a fraud. Presidents do this all the time. If you prosecuted a president for the kind of action that Nixon took with the CIA, Every president who's preceded him would have to be prosecuted. You can go down to FDR, who tells the FBI not to inv investigate Sumner Wells because they're afraid he'll, he's worried he'll become discovered that he's a homosexual. You can go to I, I'm just pulling them out randomly now. Uh, Eisenhower, who has the Weather Bureau uh, painting uh, 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 the uh, that survey that U-2 plane and telling the world that's a weather plane when it's clearly a spy plane. I mean, this is a this is using an agency for some purpose other than what it was designed to do. That's what he's doing in this instance, and I just don't think that's criminal. And uh, no prosecutor would ever survive if he, uh, uh, you know, tried to prosecute that. The statute that, that, that they cited is so broad it could cover that, but then it could cover almost half the presidency uh, as, as being improper. So I, that's why I, I call it a, uh, uh, a smoking gun that, with fires blanks. Any more women in here with a question? No, okay. Yeah, here's the lady. So you refer to his, um, to Colson bringing out the worst side. Why was that? In Why did Colson bring out the dark side? Yeah, what was it about him? I don't know. Uh, this is before Chuck obviously became a born again Christian. Uh, and th there's just, uh, there's just, well, just Chuck would do whatever, pardon? Just bad blood. 
It, no, it's just that Chuck would do whatever the, the president asked. Uh, the most amazing, and this happens pretty early, uh, where I learn about it, is one day Jack Caulfield, who'd been assigned to my office, uh, former New York City detective, comes into the office, and he's wide-eyed. And, and New York City detectives don't get wide-eyed about much of anything. They, they've seen about everything. And he says to me, he says, John, he said, you've got to help me. I just came from Colson's office, and he wants me to firebomb the Brookings Institute. I said, what? <laughs> he says he wants me to firebomb the Brookings Institute to find out and to go in when the we, uh, fire department responds to break in the vault and get out a copy of the Pentagon Papers or related government documents that the president thinks are in there. Well, I said, I said to, to Caulfield, I said, don't do anything. Just don't do anything. Uh, <coughs> I got on the next courier flight to Cal, this is in, this is in July of 71. I got on the next courier flight to California where the president was uh, with his senior staff and told Ehrlichman I was coming, that was a Friday. I got out there and met with him Monday morning, went into Ehrlichman's office. Meanwhile, I'd pulled, before I left the office, uh, the DC code and found out that if anybody dies in an arson, it's a capital offense in the District of Columbia. Uh, I was just trying to bolster any arguments I could add. So I, because Caulfield had said that Colson had assured him that this had been cleared with Ehrlichman, uh, so why I went to Ehrlichman. Uh, I go into the office, I have to, first he has a meeting that morning with Don Nixon, the president's brother, and I have to cool my heels while I'm waiting to get in. Uh, and I finally get in, I explain this to him uh, in somewhat of an agitated manner because I thought it was just incredibly stupid. I mean, just uh, outrageously stupid. Uh, I later learned that Liddy was behind it, which uh, tells me a lot. You know, Liddy, <laughs> Liddy, Liddy sells himself as some sort of James Bond character that joined the White House. Uh, he's actually not quite the Maxwell Smart character who, <laughs> who joined the White House. But anyway, uh, I, I explained this to Ehrlichman, and he calmly picks up the phone and says to the operator, get me Chuck Colson, has Colson on the line and says, Chuck, uh, young counsel dean is out here, doesn't think the Brookings is a very good idea, uh, turn it off. Um, turns to me, said, anything else, counselor? I said, no, sir, that, that'll take care of it, and went back to Washington. Uh, I learned as a result of that, and uh, actually Bud Krogh, who ran the plumbers, later told me about it, he, that they thought that I had revealed myself as a little old lady for coming out and killing this. I didn't know and didn't learn until actually Cutler's tapes came out that on three occasions the president is literally pounding on his desk demanding this break in. And this has a huge, this has a, one of the things I don't do is a lot of commentary in the book. I'm convinced that when Watergate occurs, Nixon does not remember, is not quite sure whether or not he has actually instructed Colson to send Hunt uh, in this mission. He gets it confused with the Brookings, uh, and he has this in the back of his mind, and until, for a couple of weeks, until he gets comfort that Colson isn't involved, he's worried that he might be involved. Uh, and this is one of the other reasons that the cover-up goes forward as it does, because of this prior experience. It, it all just kind of, all these things just fit together when you hear it sequentially in the way it all goes together. Yes. Um, I, I don't, but that doesn't answer why he, he would, Colson, I don't know. I mean, he just, they just appeared to appeal to each other's darker instincts. I, and in fact, I put a footnote in there that uh, uh, Jan, uh, the, I call them minders who take authors around, apparently opened the book and saw it, and, and she said, I saw this little footnote where Colson says he did things that were even worse uh, that he went to his grave with. In fact, he tells me at one point, uh, he boasts on it. He said, I did things that are criminal, but no one's ever going to find them out because I, I'm never going to tell anybody. And he was good to his word. He took him to his grave. Uh, so anyway, yes, question. Um, Arthur Schlesinger Jr. wrote a book, The Imperial President. Yes. Um, I wrote a book for Arthur, as you might, might or not. I, I, I did a book on of all presidents. I called Arthur. He's talking about a book that was done called The Imperial Presidency by Arthur Schlesinger. And I'd known Arthur for years. And he did a book on all 42 past presidents, and I learned he was doing the series. So I called him, and I said, Arthur, I said, obviously I shouldn't go near the Nixon biography. I wouldn't go near it. 
but who is going to do Warren Harding? He said, that's a good question. I don't know who I'm going to give Warren Harding to. I said, I'd like to take a crack at Warren Harding because I grew up in Warren Harding's hometown. I think I've read every book on Warren Harding. I think he's a president who's gotten one of the worst shakes in history because no historian really looks at the facts. Um, I've often thought maybe it's because I felt I brought one president down, I had to bring another one up. <laughs> <laughs> All baloney. All baloney. Well, anyway, do you feel that, um, or how, how do you view Nixon's presidency uh, as it has influenced uh, presidents that have come after? How do I feel that Nixon? Presidents are more imperial now than what's less How do I feel the Nixon presidency influenced those that followed, and are they more imperial today than they were then? Uh, they. What happened is, post Watergate, the Congress starts exercising its constitutional powers and it becomes something of a co equal institution. Uh, this seemed to trouble Dick Cheney deep, deeply. I wrote a book called Worse Than Watergate. And, the, and the, one of the reasons I wrote that book is the secrecy that Dick Cheney sold to Bush II as what they should have is far exceeds anything Nixon did. And I don't think Richard Nixon, in his deepest, darkest moment, would have authorized torture post 9-11. Uh, I watched him in, and I know he, you know he served in the South Pacific during World War II. He is aware of waterboarding. I watched the way he handled some things like Milai and, and atrocities which uh, troubled him deeply. Uh, and he was a president that who's had a wonderful grasp of the potentials of blowback, what we call blowback today. It uh, wasn't that the, f the phrase then, but he worried about those kinds of consequences. And now today, of course, you know, the, uh, the ISIS people are uh, waterboarding and saying we're doing it because the CIA does it. So we're getting the full blowback. Uh, so I, I think in, in one sense, uh, the imperial presidency has now become something of a norm. Uh, when Nixon said uh, to, to uh, David Frost, you know, when a president does it, it's, Ill, it's legal, uh, that, that question has never been resolved. In fact, we see Obama, uh, who uses drones with no authority, uh, he's never done anything about the torture problem. Uh, he's, 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 a, he, he's abandoned the policy, it's not his policy to use torture. But nobody paid uh, the piper for, for that, and it's still uh, uh, a precedent that's out there. And that precedent, of course, goes right back to Lincoln uh, and, and the extraordinary steps that Lincoln takes, the extraordinary steps that uh, FDR took uh, in wartime. And they be tend to work themselves into a domestic uh, area. I, I, I did not hear the president's speech tonight, but I, I know he's, he, he thinks he can act without congressional authority. Uh, and I don't think that's quite the way the founders once contemplated it, but it's the way it's evolved. And a lot of that is because Congress doesn't want to make those decisions uh, and would rather not. Uh, they'd rather have a president make some of these decisions. Question? I read that George Wills um, said that, uh, that, that um, Nixon and Kissinger committed treason that during the, Johnson, the end of the Johnson administration. 68 election. I'm sorry? During the 68 election. That, that they he sabotaged the, uh, the uh, peace efforts uh, by sending a, uh, an emissary to the, uh, the, the Vietnamese uh, generals to, uh, to not give in. Do you, you find that? Well, the, one of the, the, there was a guy who I actually inherited for a short while on my staff by the name of Tom Charles Houston, uh, who did a study, what they called the bombing halt study. Uh, this, was, this happened in, late in the, in the 68 election when Nixon uh, and Humphrey are running, and the argument being that Nixon does this where he sends a back channel to the president of South Vietnam, uh, uh, President Tu, uh, to try to tell him don't accept a deal with Lyndon Johnson, which will end the war uh, with this bombing halt, because I'll give you a better deal. Uh, Houston, who tried to look at it just based on all the evidence he could find, 
it was very inconclusive on what he found. This, there is some thought that this is what Nixon believed was in the Brookings Institute, was their version of Johnson's bombing study, uh, because Johnson will later privately on a tele recorded telephone call accuse Nixon of treason uh, for this activity. There's no evidence that Nixon himself does this. Uh, as high as it seems to go <coughs> is to Spiro Agnew and some thoughts that Agnew and, and Mitchell had talked about it. Uh, but, you know, first of all, it, it is probably not treason as the, as the crime is defined. Uh, and the, the evidence is pretty, pretty inconclusive as to whether that happened or not, from best I can tell. Let's do one more question, unless there's a, that's right here, yes. Did you know Spiro Agnew at all? Did I know Spiro Agnew? Not well. Uh, he and I shared an interesting experience. We flew to Chicago together in a Gulf Stream, and they couldn't get the landing gear down. <laughs> <laughs> and we had to circle Chicago for quite a while until they came out and ripped up a couple chairs and seats in the plane and in the carpet, and they hand cranked it down. And so we got had a nice conversation. We thought it might be our last. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I didn't know him really well, but I actually then years after he left, uh, I happened to see him in Palm Springs. He was going up an escalator and I was going down another escalator in a shopping center there and he spotted me. He said, come around and talk to me as we went by each other. So we had a nice little visit and we kind of reminisced on this kind of uh, momentarily traumatic experience flight we had uh, that we both survived. Do you have any opinion of him as a, as a man, as a politician? As I, I don't, you know, I've read his book uh, and, 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 and his take on what happened to him uh, and, you know, I really don't know the facts well enough to draw a conclusion, but I, it does look like he was taking envelopes from the uh, state contractors in Maryland right up through his vice presidency, and that's not a good thing to do, particularly if you're not paying tax on them. So <laughs> I, think, I thank you all and hope you have a good read. I, I, I guess uh, I'm signing books somewhere. Okay.